Hello everyone, welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. Um, today the video webcam function has been disabled somehow or it's not working with GoToWebinar. So you're just going to hear us and hear our slides, uh, but we thank you for joining us today. In today's webinar, Jessica Keating will discuss the results of a study on attitudes of abortion published by the McGrath Institute for Church Life and what it means for the church today. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Parish and Curriculum Marketing Specialist at Ave Maria Press. I would like to recognize our webinar partners, the National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the Catholic Campus Ministry Association. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions may be sent to our presenter using the questions section of the GoToWebinar panel that you see here. Um, and I'll read as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation today. This webinar is being recorded and a link to that recording will be sent to you tomorrow via email. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today. Jess Keating directs the Notre Dame Office of Life and Human Dignity in the McGrath Institute for Church Life. In her role, she leads the Institute's research, education, and outreach efforts around life and human dignity issues and spearheads the Institute's development of pro-life curriculum and resources. Jess originally hails from the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C. She completed her undergraduate degree in philosophy and sociology from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. After teaching for five years on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, she earned her Master's of Divinity from the University of Notre Dame in 2013. In addition to her work with the Institute, she is pursuing her PhD in Systematic Theology at Notre Dame. Jess, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Erin. It's great to Wonderful. be here. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter. Wonderful. So we will see your screen. All right, you can take it from here. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with you. Um, I'm excited to, to tell you a little bit more about a study we published this past summer. Um, and also what it means for the church um, in relation to how Americans think about abortion. Um, what we know about um, how Americans understand abortion is actually perhaps more limited than we might think. Our national conversation tends to take place along two broadly binary lines. Um, if we were to simply sort of pay attention to the political rhetoric that's out there and news media on sort of both sides, we would think that your average American is either a dyed-in-the-wool pro-lifer or a dyed-in-the-wool pro-choicer. Um, but if we peel back sort of this first layer of, of narrative, we actually find a lot of ambiguity. So what I want to do is start with throwing, showing you three statistics. The first one is 47%. And this is the percentage of Americans who in the last general social survey in 2018, when asked should abortion remain legal, said it depends. And this was the majority of Americans said it depends. Um, so not a lot of clarity or maybe a, a lot of exceptions or um, restrictions there, but it depends. Likewise, when asked about the morality of abortion, 43% of Americans again said it depends. And finally, according to a Knights of Columbus and Marist poll, 47% of Americans who self-identify as pro-choice support significant restrictions on abortion such as gestational limits um, or um, typically gestational limits. And likewise, those who will um, self-identify as pro-life often support um, 
are in favor of exceptions, for example, in cases of rape and incest or life of the mother. So we have these numbers um, that show us there is ambiguity, but they don't really help us understand the contours of that ambiguity or that complexity in how Americans think about abortion. So in terms of like what these numbers tell us, 47%, 43%, 47%, um, they suggest first that Americans uh, are deeply ambivalent about abortion. Um, for the majority uh, answered, it depends for both morality and legality. And we find that uh, position labels aren't always instructive of what a person's views actually are. So those labels of pro-life, pro-choice can actually contain a lot of internal variation. So for instance, someone who identifies as pro-life might want um, might want uh, exceptions. Somebody who identifies as pro-choice might want restrictions, even significant restrictions on abortion access. So while these survey statistics um, and survey statistics in general are very helpful because they point to the complexity perhaps of how Americans think about abortion, they don't really give us a very clear picture of the story behind um, Americans' views on abortion. So we hear it depends, but we don't know what it depends on. They don't tell us why an overwhelming number of Americans say it depends to both morality and legality, or why people who identify as pro-choice might support significant restrictions on abortion. So this really intrigued us. Um, and as helpful as statistical data is, because it tends to offer limited response choices, usually a yes, a no, or a maybe, or it, it depends, we get limited information. And we began to wonder what might be missing uh, from this survey data and whether there might be a way to, to unearth the story behind people's responses to close-ended polling or survey data. So we decided to find out. Um, in 2018, we commissioned a landmark study designed to help us elicit, um, designed to help us understand what the average American thinks about abortion, but not only that, also how they think about abortion. In other words, what thoughts and experiences do they bring to bear when they're talking about abortion? What influences the way they think about it? And what this might mean for the Catholic Church. So over the course of a year, a team of six sociologists spanning six major geographical regions of the United States, we had sociologists in California, in Colorado, in Indiana, in North Dakota, in Pennsylvania, and in Tennessee. So these, this team of six sociologists conducted over 200 interviews, 217 interviews, face-to-face -face interviews with a nationally representative sample of average ordinary Americans. So they weren't looking for advocates, on either side. They weren't looking for people who were like necessarily particularly well informed. They were really looking to unearth the story behind how the average American thinks about abortion. And they met with people in coffee shops and in libraries. They sat across kitchen tables and in Americans' living rooms to hear their stories. Over the course of approximately 75 minutes, folks were asked a series of questions designed not simply to determine what they think about abortion, but also to probe those thoughts and feelings and experiences and resources that um, inform their views about abortion. And this is the kind of information that can't be gleaned from polling data. This is the kind of uh, rich information that can really only be um, gleaned from face-to-face -face conversation. So for the first time then, we have not only a deeper understanding of what Americans think about abortion, but also 
for the first time an understanding about how they think about abortion and what informs their views about abortion. And so this study, um, How Americans Understand Abortion, is the first ever study um, of a national interview-based study of your average American's attitudes toward abortion. So what I'd like to do is um, talk through some of the major findings of the interviewers, um, what they found as major themes over the course of these 200 plus interviews. The first thing they found is that Americans don't talk a lot about abortion. Um, for all of the noise that we have about this issue at the political level, the average American doesn't talk about abortion in their day-to-day -day lives. For most interviewees, those who were interviewed, um, this was the first time they'd ever had an extended conversation about this issue. Um, for many, it's uncomfortable to talk about, particularly when they think about talking about it with family or friends or coworkers. Uh, people are hesitant to engage these questions because of our larger uh, political discourse and also out of fear of perhaps damaging relationships. So there's really a lot of silence around abortion. And at the end of the interviews, interviewers often had a, what is a very rare experience in social science research. They had people thanking them for the opportunity to speak at length about this issue. So take um, Mira, for instance, and, and all of the names in the study are, are pseudonyms. Mira says, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about abortion in a way that's more nuanced than our current political discourse allows for. Because I think that a lot of the simple yes, no, or sometimes questions don't really get at the heart of what's going on here. So here Mira is even sort of making a comment on polling data and survey data that, that can't really get to the heart of what's happening around people's thinking about abortion. Um, so interviewers had the experience of people not only thanking them at the end of interviews, but calling them back to refine something they said, to make a correction. And this, is, this doesn't happen typically in social science research. Um, I was a sociology major in college and you do your interview and then you never see or talk to the person again. So it was clear that, that talking about this issue uh, touched people at a deep level. The second major finding is that uh, survey statistics tend to oversimplify Americans' attitudes about abortion. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the, um, the you know, 47%, the 43%, those numbers tend to be oversimplified. So we're going to look at a number of, uh, that, that tells us about how Catholics who support um, uh, keeping abortion legal in all or most cases. The thought is here is that these statistics are tend to be oversimplified. They don't really get into the nitty gritty or nuance of how people are thinking. But because these interviews lasted over an hour, interviewees had the opportunity to think out loud, as it were, about abortion. And remember, for many, this was the first time they were doing this. And so they often revised or corrected something they had said. Sometimes they contradicted previous answers. And this gives us greater insight into the complex ways that Americans think about abortion. It's not surprising that we should see this kind of um, real-time revision, contradiction, um, correction, if this is the first time people are talking about it. And they're actually sorting through their understanding as they're talking. Um, so in fact, Americans express a really wide range of attitudes about abortion, both as a moral and a legal issue, um, ranging from total opposition to total permissiveness to often positions somewhere in between. So for instance, some of those interviewed, but a minority might think that abortion is totally morally acceptable and think that there should be no restrictions on abortion, that it should be legal in all cases. 
um, and vice versa. Often though, you find um, people in between. They might think it's immoral, but support some form of legality or not think it's moral um, or think it's moral, but, but still support some form of restriction. Um, so you find really a whole host of positions uh, where people situate themselves. And it is notable when we think about moral and legal opposition, how for many Americans, these two things are divorced from one another. So you can be morally opposed, but not legally opposed. Um, and this does speak to a, a larger question about the relationship between ethics and law and how Americans understand that relationship. The point here is that our survey statistics tend to lack the nuance, the complexity, and thus oversimplify what Americans are actually thinking about abortion. So if survey statistics oversimplify attitudes, then it's not surprising that position labels are often imprecise for actual views about abortion. And we saw this in the Knights of Columbus uh, Marist poll, that you have 47% of people who self-identify as pro-choice uh, pro um, supporting significant restrictions on abortion. So it's clear that that label is, an, is imprecise. Um, it can mean different things to different people. So um, when we looked at and, and this is from our study. When we look at from our study, the participants were allowed not to choose one label or another, but to sort of grade themselves along a scale. Um, you find the two ends, you have the most pro-choice being one and most pro-life being 10, and you have about equal, equal numbers who position themselves at those two ends. But in the middle, we find a lot of variation, tremendous variation of people who, who identify as somewhere in between. And this is not captured in our current national um, polling data. So you actually have um, much more ambiguity um, when it comes to what these labels mean um, and what people mean when they say they are pro-life or pro-choice. So most Americans, most of those interviewed um, feel somewhere in the middle of this continuum from most pro-choice to most pro-life. And this means that if they're given a binary choice on a survey, their answer may not reflect their actual views. So I'm going to take the fourth and fifth points together. Um, the fourth is that Americans talk as much um, about what happens before and after as excuse me, abortion talk concerns as much as what happens before and after as it does abortion itself. So abortion is contextualized within a larger frame. And the fifth insight is that Americans think about a good life as much as they do life itself. Um, so Americans' views about abortion reflect questions about the nature of the relationship between conceiving partners. Um, the nature and permissibility of contraception, financial and or relational support, health and parenthood, as well as a myriad of other social issues and personal decisions. So abortion, the way your ordinary American thinks about abortion is not abortion as sort of a standalone question, but as contextualized within a broader set of questions. Um, interviewees will raise questions about whether and when life exists through a discussion of contraception, of fetal development and viability, of what medical interventions are possible, of when abortion occurs during a pre pregnancy. But just as often, they talk about what the essentials of a good life for a, a child and her parents might be, um, which often includes uh, health financial stability, affection, rights, the ability to pursue opportunities, very much middle-class values. So considerations of a good life, what constitutes a good life, um, especially for those who are more permissive toward abortion is very important. 
Um, so for those who, who fall more on the pro-choice or permissive end of the spectrum, they are gonna consider what makes a life worth living um, as much or more than they are gonna consider the value of life in and of itself. So these two insights, um, and again, interviewers aren't making moral evaluations of these two insights, which we, we might very well want to do. Um, they, are just, they are just showing us how Americans think through these questions. So these insights suggest that the ordinary, typical American thinks about abortion in light of a lot of different considerations that Americans draw on what, um, what the study's uh, authors call wells of meaning. Um, in other words, people will articulate their views about abortion based on a range of different factors, including personal experience, views about parenthood, politics, religion, and even what they think are facts, such as when conception occurs, gestational development, and law. So on this last point, on, on Americans drawing on facts, um, researchers found that many Americans know remarkably little about the legal history of abortion um, and know fairly little about fetal development. So most um, inter th of those interviewed had heard of Roe v. Wade. Um, but few could tell you the contours of the case uh, beyond the fact that, that this was the case that, you know, quote unquote, made abortion legal. Um, and none of those interviewed of the 217 had heard of uh, Roe's sister case, Doe v. Bolton, um, which established what constitutes health um, in, in considering um, abortion. So there's very little understanding of the political and legal history of abortion. Um, and there's also very little understanding of uh, scientific, the, sort of the facts of fetal development. So for example, um, Michael, one of those interviewed says, I would argue that it's not entirely a human being. I understand that it's like not a magic day. The next day it's a human being, it's a process but I don't know enough about any of it scientifically to have a really strong opinion on it. So here you have Michael sort of noting that he knows he doesn't know, um, but there were other interviewees who you know, thought that the fetal heartbeat started at 20 weeks um, rather than within the first month of fetal development. So you had a really wide range of knowledge about um, law and fetal development but I think what we can often take for granted, particularly those in, in sort of my field in advocacy on probably either side is how well-informed Americans actually are and how well-educated they actually are. Because uh, we might swim in this world, um, it can be easy to, easy to forget that many don't actually know uh, the science, the law, the history of abortion in this country. Likewise, many Americans, and, and this is a point I'll touch on in, in a few moments, don't have the ethical uh, frameworks and language to really um, make sense of and move with ease through difficult moral issues. Okay, so we have five of our seven major findings. Our six major finding um, is that abortion is not merely a political issue to everyday Americans, but an intimately personal one. Now, at first glance, this might seem to follow the standard line that abortion is something that the government shouldn't be involved in um, and shouldn't regulate because it's a personal decision made between a woman and her doctor. That's how we might initially read this finding. But actually this finding uh, speaks to the fact that ordinary Americans views about abortion are deeply shaped, whether one way or the other, whether for or against, um, by personal experience. So whether people have had an abortion, know someone who's had an abortion, 
personal experience is deeply influential to how your average American is going to make sense of abortion. So the interview, the interview team didn't set out to find um, men or women who had experience with abortion. Um, nevertheless, about one quarter of the sample had either had an abortion or was the partner of someone who had had an abortion. And this tracks with national statistical data that about a quarter to a third of women have experienced abortion and uh, likewise for men. And upward of 75% of the interviewees, the, the sample here, knew someone, either a friend or a family member who had had an abortion. So when we say that abortion is not merely a political issue, but deeply personal, what we mean is that Americans know people who have had abortions. They have themselves had abortions. So this is something that touches people at a very deeply uh, intimate personal level, whether it's themselves or in relationship with others. Notably, there's no obvious correlation between a person's experience with abortion and their moral or legal attitude toward abortion. So that is whether they're permissive or, um, or oppose abortion. Nevertheless, people's experience itself does have one way or the other a significant pull. So you might find somebody who draws heavily on their personal experience to explain why they're pro-life. They experienced an abortion, it was a devastating experience for them, and they had a change of heart. Likewise, you might find someone who has experienced abortion and they may even regret it, but that is why they are they identify as pro-choice or on the more, more pro-choice end of the spectrum. The point is not that personal experience um, impacts one way or the other, leading somebody to be more pro-life or more pro-choice, but that it is one of those wells of meaning, one of those resources that people draw on when they talk about abortion. So finally, the last finding is that Americans don't want abortion. So this is actually very interesting. Americans remain deeply ambivalent about abortion. And this is after, you know, 20 or 30 years of really um, pronounced advocacy to normalize abortion. We often hear abortion described as a positive social good um, from abortion providers and something that we as a society should embrace wholeheartedly. But this is really out of step, this view with how ordinary Americans actually engage the question of abortion. Almost everyone interviewed, even those who have the, have the most permissive moral and legal um, attitudes about abortion, viewed abortion as a serious and morally weighty decision. And in some cases, even those who were most permissive cried when they were talking about abortion. So no one wants to see more abortion. Among your average Americans, there's no sense in which you know, abortion is not a big deal, something that we should just you know, expand, um, that more women should be participating in. It is, real, it is seen as something that is very morally weighty, um, even for those who, who say it's not morally weighty or who have permissive legal attitudes toward abortion. So these seven findings um, give us a much richer and deeper understanding of how Americans actually um, sort through the question of abortion and related questions. Americans really see abortion as nested within a whole um, matrix of, of um, ancillary questions. When reflecting on this study, Richard Dorflinger, who is the former associate director of the USCCB's pro-life secretariat, um, wrote, that this study underscores the need for a more informed, more sympathetic, less stereotyped conversation about abortion with family, friends, and neighbors. 
in the process, we may even understand more deeply our own convictions. So what does this mean for the church? What do these seven findings have to say to us in our pastoral ministry as teachers, as pastors, etc.? Well, we know from national polling data that American Catholics do not uh, differ significantly from the general population when it comes to the issue of abortion. Um, a recent Pew survey, um, more than half, about 56% of self-identified Catholics uh, said they thought abortion should be legal in all or more, most cases. Now remember what we said about statistical data a bit earlier. So this is not going to capture um, that richness of perspective because people were only given a binary choice, legal in all our most cases on the one hand, illegal in all our most cases on the other hand. So we're not getting that nuance um, or qualifications that people might offer if we talk to them. But if we're simply painting with a broad brush it's instructive, um, and the interviews bore out a similar, re a similar reality. Approximately 50% um, of those who identified as Catholic uh, said that they supported the legality of abortion. Um, slightly more than half identified as pro-choice or on the pro-choice side than pro-life. Um, yet Catholics also display a lot of um, internal variation as a group um, about their views. Catholics were by no means a monolithic group. And um, religion came in and out of their views in interesting ways. Um, so the American Catholic um, perspective on abortion, which, which again mirrors the general population. And this is where the breakdown tends to be more aligned with political affiliation um, than with the church, as it is with many other social issues. Um, if this is true though, so that you know somewhere over 50% of Catholics are identified as pro-choice, um, then we might also assume that it's true that Catholics might have the same kind of complex views that other Americans have. And that's precisely, as I, as I just indicated, is what interviewers found. Um, that Catholics uh, really struggle, many, with the question of abortion. Some are strongly opposed. Um, some see abortion as part of a larger complex of life issues, um, promoting a consistent ethic of life. Um, some are very comfortable simply dissenting from the church's teaching. Um, some believe um, really genuinely that life is precious and also feel unqualified to make, um, to, to have strong feelings about you know, a, a particular case. So a lot of it depends among Catholics. So what might this mean for us in, in our ministries? Um, well, first of all, it means that we have a tremendous opportunity um, to engage the faithful. Um, and those who have fallen away and those who are not Catholic in meaningful conversation and in creative outreach and education. So I'd like to offer sort of three guidelines or three thoughts for pastoral ministry, um, teaching um, and, and lay ministry in the church for how, what this study might mean for us in the church today. So the first is the need to create meaningful spaces for people to have conversation. Um, what interviewers found was that people wanted to talk about abortion. Um, that when given the opportunity to speak in a context that um, was not highly politically charged, that was less focused on debates and more focused on deep listening, people were really willing and happy to engage that. Not only do people want to talk about abortion, but they can, they can do it under the right circumstances. But most people don't know how to create these spaces or how to ha start having these conversations. And this is, I think, really good news for, 
for us as church. Um, those interviewed really welcomed the opportunity to talk about abortion. Many, as the quote from um, Mira that I shared earlier suggests, have never had a conversation before. Um, and what's very interesting is that in the course of these interviews, some people even began to change their minds about previously held attitudes about abortion. And often this was in sort of a more pro-life direction. So people, just by talking about it um, and having someone listen, were actually able to have insights for themselves. Um, but that's not gonna happen if people don't actually have those opportunities. So one of the keys to these conversations is de-escalating the sometimes vitriolic um, political rhetoric that can surround these issues and to really listen deeply to what's informing people's experiences, what's informing their attitudes, um, and to receiving people's stories. Now that doesn't mean that we receive them and we say, that's great, we're so glad you dissent from the church, but that reception of story and of where a person is, is the first step. Um, and for many of those interviewed, at least some of them, the process actually allowed them to have insights that they might not otherwise have had. So the church, in terms of our catechetical and pastoral outreach, has the opportunity to create spaces for genuine dialogue. And again, dialogue does not mean moral uh, compromising the moral teaching of the church. Um, but it does require a genuine desire to listen deeply, uh, to go gently, and not to sort of rush or coerce people into changing their minds. Um, conversion is the work of God, and we have a very important role to play, um, and that's one of cooperation. So speaking from my own experience, as somebody who, who was previously uh, pro-choice and very pro-choice, um, the more I felt like someone was trying to make me change my my opinion sort of the more I dug in my heels um, and so providing these spaces where where people can um, can talk about their experiences I think is so important and remembering that um, the work of conversion may be slow um, but but God is working um, God worked in my own life it took you know eight years but it happened and so ours is one of creating the conditions where conversion of heart can happen. So that's the first thing, creating spaces for people to have meaningful conversation around abortion and difficult moral issues in general. The second thing um, that I think is important for us as church um, that we can glean from this study is the promotion of an inter integrative approach um, to, to abortion. So there, there are sort of three different ways we might think of this. There are tremendous opportunities that we have uh, for creative education and pastoral outreach. Um, this study revealed that Americans really lack uh, basic knowledge about fetal development. Think back to Michael's quote. Um, they lack understanding, a deep understanding of the church's ethical teaching um, and, and don't have a moral framework in which to think about difficult questions, including abortion. And they lack knowledge of the legal history of abortion and the history of the pro-life movement. Um, and also the, sci the, the science sort of of abortion. So many Americans will believe uh, that, that, you know, were abortion to be illegal, we would see skyrocketing deaths from illegal abortions. Because most Americans don't know that it was not legal abortion that, um, that, that prevented women from dying from abortions. It was penicillin, um, which, which uh, came around in the late 1940s. So we saw the precipitous drop in, in abortion-related deaths among women in the late 1940s, early 1950s, not around the 1970s and legalized abortion. But Americans simply don't know that. Um, so we need, to, um, we need to really think about how we integrate uh, abortion and life and human dignity issues more broadly in the work of education and formation. 
And I think our young people are a particularly important group to be working with. Um, so while on the one hand, we need to fill the knowledge gaps, like just what don't people know? Um, they should know that, that the heartbeat starts within the first month, not at 20 weeks. But in addition to sort of filling these gaps of knowledge, uh, we, also want, we also want this to be accompanied by a renewed understanding of the human person as an embodied creature embedded in relationships of uncalculated giving and receiving. And this means that the work of education um, in educating people about law, about history, about science, about ethics, um, can't simply be um, information dissemination. So, because it's not always true that once people have the right information, they'll necessarily draw the right ethical conclusions. So I'll give you an example. I read a, an article in Slate Magazine several years ago um, that was advocating a strongly pro-choice position and, and said, yes, this is a human child. We know this, science tells us this, there's no need to debate the fact, but that a woman should still be able to terminate the pregnancy to terminate the life of her child, uh, irregardless of this fact. So it's not just enough, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient only to fill in these gaps of knowledge. There's also the work of formation which needs to take place. So education needs to also aid in the formation of a disposition of heart. And that requires um, a really distinctive mode of education. So most of the Catholics and former Catholics interviewed know or have a general, generally a good enough knowledge of what the church teaches. Their problem isn't one of knowledge, it's one of deep understanding and appropriation. So education must be at the same time formation. As catechetical leaders, ministers, teachers, um, pastors, there's a need for us to create environments and to develop integrative pedagogies where people can have the insight for themselves, where they can have the, their aha moment, um, where they can experience that conversion. And so I'll just say from my, from my own story, the work of conversion, of having that aha moment was both a, a long journey, probably longer than it needed to be if, if I had had somebody who I could have had these conversations with. Um, but I didn't even realize that I had become uh, pro-life sort of in this process until I had a friend who asked me for money for an abortion. And I realized I, could, I just could not, um, I could not give her that money, but, but I could support her. And even after that, I remained sort of notionally pro-choice. And it wasn't until I had a, a professor um, in graduate school, really, um, somebody I, I very much respected really challenged me um, on the logic of my thinking that I had that sort of full conversion. Um, so, and, and this was part of both education and formation. So I began learning more, but I also was forming those dispositions of heart that helped me to receive this vision of what it means to be human. So at the, at the macro level, um, education and pastoral outreach means that we need to relate these issues, the issue of abortion, other life issues, um, which are embedded in Catholic social teaching. These can't be an addendum to formation um, and education. They have to be integrated thoroughly throughout. So the work we do in, in the McGrath Institute in my office is to develop curriculum that can be used by high school teachers and adapted uh, in, by pastoral ministers to engage life and human dignity issues across the curriculum. Um, so in science, in math even, in um, history, that students have the opportunity to engage these questions um, in all of the disciplines and that they do it according to, to the standards of that discipline, and that they are given the opportunity and freedom to think critically for themselves. So again, recall that most Catholics know what the church teaches. That's less of the issue than the issue of appropriation. So giving people the opportunity to sort of think themselves um, into, uh, 
into the church's moral vision of the human being is invaluable. Um, it is. It will be far more impactful than than telling them only what that moral vision is. So providing sort of these integrative um, teaching and learning uh, experiences, I think, is essential. And this is also a renewal to an uh, invitation to renewal and preaching. Um, I think that life issues, particularly abortion, are rarely preached on. And often uh, when they are, uh, the, the preaching might not strike the, the tone that's needed. Again, remember that if Catholics sort of mirror the general population, then a, then a quarter to a third of those in our, in our parishes have, have experienced an abortion. And so how do we preach the truth about um, the, the, the grave evil that abortion is in a way that invites people to healing? in a way that invites people to deeper conversion. Um, and so I think there's a real invitation to an integrative renewal, renewal of preaching around um, life and human dignity issues, particularly abortion. The third thing I'll say is that um, I think we're invited to develop a unified approach, a consistent ethic of life, that upholds the integral links, again, <laughs> integration, between justice for the unborn and, ju and other forms of justice. So in addition to educational eth efforts that seek to advance a consistent ethic of life and uplift the integral unit, unity of um, prenatal justice and other issues of justice, um, our pastoral ministries will also want to do this. As the study um, reveals Americans' understanding and how they sort of contextualize abortion is multidimensional. Abortion is nested within a variety of other human dignity concerns like healthcare, like social support, economic support, equality. And so our pastoral outreach and education must also be multidimensional. Um, people are going to access the full breadth and depth of the meaning of human dignity through a variety of different starting places. So in my own story, I came into the Catholic Church, was very impassioned by the church's um, social doctrine, um, and that's really what, what made me want to become a Catholic. And that was sort of the, the point at which I got on the train. Um, but the train kept moving. And as I explored other cars in the train, I came to understand more deeply where the, where CST came from, its, its uh, vision of the human person. And that was also instrumental in sort of helping me realize that, that I couldn't be pro-choice anymore, um, that it was incoherent for me to be pro-choice. And so I think that we have lots of different stops that people can get on um, if they're concerned about healthcare, if they're concerned about um, equality. There are lots of different ways we can enter into conversations around abortion and can enter into conversations more broadly around life and human dignity issues. And so providing those different access points, um, I think is sort of essential for opening up this, these questions for people to have fruitful and meaningful conversations and ultimately to have, um, to have a change of heart. So just to review, um, my three sort of recommendations of what this study means for the church um, is that we're invited to create spaces for people to have meaningful conversation. We're invited to promote an integrative approach uh, to education, to pastoral formation, to preaching. And we're invited to promote a consistent ethic of life that upholds those links between prenatal justice and other forms of justice. So I wanna thank you all so much. I went a little longer than I wanted to, but I'm happy uh, to answer questions or hear feedback. Yes, thank you so much, Jessica. I invite, as you mentioned, anybody to send in a question here. We've already had a few that have come in, um, but thank you so much for sharing this this really interesting study. It certainly um, gives us a lot to think about um, in, our, in our conversations, um, as well as in our ministries. 
Um, Beth had a question about the demographics of the study participants. Mm -hmm. Can you give us any background on that and how those people were chosen? Sure, absolutely. I'm pulling up the demographics right now. I don't have it on a slide, but I can uh, okay. talk you through it. So the way the sample was selected um, was through a randomized uh, mailing. I'm not a sociologist, so a sociologist could speak better to this. And also the study has, I, uh, the studies online, I would invite anyone who's interested to read it. But through standard sociological um, randomized practices, abortion was not disclosed as the subject of the interview in the initial screening process. Um, both, you know, to avoid those who like really want to talk about abortion and so as not to deter those who might be more reticent. Um, and the demographics are generally nationally representative. So the, the goal in qualitative or interview-based research is not the same to have the same numbers per se as um, a, a survey sample, but to go deeper into talking with people um, and to sort of unearthing those layers of meaning. Nevertheless, the, the um, sample characteristics are broadly representative of the US population. 33% um, of the sample identified as liberal, 33 as moderate, 34 as conservative. Um, you have a full range of religious preferences, of religious attendance, of race, of age, um, span sort of the entire age range from uh, Gen Z to the silent generation. Um, a generally um, representative sample of male versus female. And again, same with education, marital status. So the interview process, um, when, when interviewers are doing this kind of research, they are looking for a sample that reflects the makeup of the United States. Um, and so that's, that's what they did. But I would invite um, Beth or anyone else who's interested to uh, download the study and take a look at it. And we just have to Google it. Um, it's available or, on mcgrath.nd.edu. Uh, okay. And I can provide you the backslash link in one moment. I can include that too in the email that I sent out tomorrow Great. for you folks. Um, I'll send it to you. And, and okay. Yeah, feel free to. Yeah, that's fine. So I've got a couple of questions here regarding, you know, you talked about creating a space for meaningful conversation. Mm -hmm. Can you give us ideas maybe of what that would look like, um, maybe pre-COVID or during COVID? Yeah, so or I both. think that, yeah, part of, part of, um, part of having meaningful conversations is, is having uh, conversations with people who, who one trusts. So there's sort of like instant trust between an interviewer and an interviewee. Um, you build that rapport very quickly. So I think one way to do this is to build this into pre-existing, uh, you know, if you have small faith sharing groups, um, building a conversation around these questions or a series of conversations around these questions into those groups um, so that you're doing it with people with whom you have a pre-existing relationship. Um, I think some of that is going to be in how these conversations are structured. So whether, you know, debate is emphasized or whether deep listening is emphasized, um, how it's framed within the teaching of the church. So I think that those are all considerations of ways to think about this. I think in, in sort of a school setting, it's a bit easier because you have the teacher who can really frame and direct the conversation. Um, but within a parish, I think you sort of have, you can have similar dynamics of a parish minister um, framing and, and directing uh, how the conversation unfolds and being very intentional about how it unfolds. And I think probably at least if, if you're thinking about having one of these conversations, being very, um, being very uh, intentional, intentional about who is invited into sort of like what initial conversations might look like. Getting some training on um, what, what listening and communication skills might be necessary. Um, the Sisters of Life have a wonderful model. We're working on a video series with them actually around these very questions that will be available to parish leaders and um, diocesan leaders. Um, but something that they emphasize is on, is on listening, on receiving people and on accompaniment. Um, 
So I think that those would all be important considerations. Um, also, you know, we talked to diocesan leaders about this study when it came out in the earlier this summer. And something that came up a few different times was um, sort of thinking differently about how we advertise events. So not advertising, come and have a conversation about abortion, you know, mm -hmm. but um, because that's gonna, that's gonna invite those who, who may already be totally convinced of the beauty and goodness of the church's teaching. Um, when, when if we're trying to reach those who might be more on the fence, um, thinking more creatively about advertising or thinking more creatively about the context in which um, we broach these conversations, again, like small faith sharing groups or in a catechetical series where the immediate, uh, the immediate topic might not be abortion, um, but can it be folded in? Can there be a gesture toward it? Can there be a space open to have that conversation in different contexts? So that would be sort of like what I would think of immediately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, we have a question here. Have you read Stephanie Gray's book, How to Argue About Abortion? I have not read that particular book. Okay. But thank Dr. you. Yeah, Dr. John Riganati um, asked that question. Maybe he can give us some feedback in the in the question panel here. Perfect. Um, yes. Yeah. So um, comment here. This was a fantastic and enlightening talk. I will be using this to plot our diocese's path forward in the pro-life movement. Awesome. And yes. no, anyone who's interested in, in reaching out, our, our office is in conversation with several dioceses about that very thing, how to, how to sort of plot out uh, from this study. So we're happy to be in conversation with anyone who would like to be in conversation going forward. Oh, wonderful. That Diane asked the same question. What are your thoughts on specific ways at a diocesan level to use or implement these findings? Yeah, so um, some of them, yeah, suggested in sort of those three um, highlights at the end. Um, some of the things we're doing with other dioceses are having um, days, like training days for people in pastoral out outreach on, on life and human dignity issues, um, mm -hmm. whether it's to provide education or formation. So we'll be doing something um, with a few archdioceses, a few dioceses in California. Um, another, uh, so we do educational events. Another thing I would recommend is taking a look at our teaching resources. Um, as a way to think about integrating um, life and human dignity issues into the curriculum. Um, with other dioceses, we've been in conversation about how to fold some of these findings or to respond to some of these findings into existing uh, faith formation programs. Um, so it's not always necessarily starting something new, um, but folding in the, the wisdom of and, and what this study found um, into what we're already doing. Um, that's sort of the goal with teaching is we're meeting all the teaching standards of say a, a history curriculum, but we're doing it in this unique way. Um, so not necessarily reinventing the wheel every time, but folding in. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Alicia asks or states, the suggestions presented here are, are good. However, the issue that it all starts at the top of the hierarchy. One challenge is that our bishops themselves have become liberals to the extent that statements like, um, who are we to judge, or we focus so much on abortion. These statements confuse Catholics and we look up to our church clergy to guide us, but we don't even hear this issue at the pulpit. Shouldn't this be addressed too? Yeah, I think we're invited to a renewal of preaching um, and that there we need to find ways to um, preach about difficult moral teachings of the church or, or, or teachings that people find difficult in ways that invite people to, particularly around abortion, to deeper healing. Um, I think that, yeah, yes, we are, inv we're invited here to, um, to a renewed, um, to a renewed form of preaching um, and, um, and pedagogy. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I know there are, are many more questions here. I'm sorry, we don't have enough time to get to them all, but I will put some links in the um, email that you all receive tomorrow um, that for further research or, or to contact McGrath and, and the work that you are doing to Jessica. Thank you again. Um, we always like to offer you all a little discount. So 25% um, off your entire order at AveMariaPress.com um, using code webinar0302 for today's date, and it expires on the 12th. I invite you to join us next Tuesday um, when Tim O'Malley will talk about why the real presence really matters and um, some of the things that we are, are dealing with, you know, um, the ecclesial and social problems that we face as a church um, after the COVID-19 pandemic and why and how the Eucharist matters. So I invite you to join us next Tuesday. Thank you all, everybody, or thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jessica, um, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.